So uh, it led to turbulent years for the nation of Israel and uh, uh, sinful warfare of God's people. And uh, this time fall into a period of years from 931 down to 721 B.C., uh, the splintered kingdom, and then 721 to 586, the single. Uh, these 345 turbulent years, 931 B.C. to 586 B.C., began with the division of Israel's tribes at Shechem and ended with the destruction of Israel's temple at Jerusalem. The transpiring events can be placed uh, there under first the splinter kingdom, 931 to 721 B.C. 931 B.C., a tragic civil war divided Israel's 12 tribes into two separate kingdoms, one in the north and one in the south. The record of this period uh, is seen, of course, in 1 Kings 12, chapters 12 through 22, and 2 Kings chapters 1 through 17, also 2 Chronicles uh, chapters 10 through 28. So this is important, and really to get a grasp of it, you have to see it. So there in your study guide, and it's one of those things where you have to sort of uh, relate back to, you know, it's not something that, if you do remember it, you're going to forget it, because <laughs> it's pretty, you know, it's just... It's big stuff, but it's minute details that, you know, you are, and it's just stuff that you sort of want to have filed somewhere, you know, that you can always uh, look to. Uh, Nineteen northern rulers during this period over the ten tribes. So northern, think ten. Nineteen uh, rulers. Twelve southern rulers over the two tribes. Uh, God's going to use Elijah and Elisha uh, through in this period. In 721 B.C., the Assyrian armies captured the ten tribes carrying many of the citizens into captivity. Uh, and then from... Uh, so from 721 to 586 B.C., 2 Kings 18, chapters 18 through 25, and 2 Chronicles 29 through 36, uh, speak of uh, this, this period of the southern, uh, the rulers, eight southern rulers. In 586 B.C., so remember 721 B.C., you have the Assyrian armies capturing the ten tribes. Now the Babylonian armies capture the two tribes, carrying many of their citizens into captivity. Uh, and uh, at this time, both Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Okay. So the northern kingdom consisted of ten tribes. And then the southern kingdom consisted of two tribes, Judah and the half-tribe of Benjamin. The north was referred to as Israel and Ephraim. So uh, like in the prophets and stuff, uh, you'll see during this period, just know that it's talking about the, because there was, you know, you had the civil war, so when they refer to Ephraim, they're, they're talking about the northern, that part of it, Israel. Ephraim was the largest and most influential tribe. So that's that's why, okay? And, um, and that, you see that. And then um, uh, the south was referred to as Judah. So this is often called uh, you, you'll see this word. And what is he talking about? They're talking about the southern tribes uh, because you had the uh, the breaking up. So two tribes, two capitals. Samaria, 
Okay, became the capital of the north. Jerusalem remained the capital of the south. Okay. Um, the north had 19 rulers. The first was uh, Jeroboam. The last was Hosea. The south had 20. The first was Rehoboam. Boom. And the last was Zedekiah. All the rulers of the north were males. One of the rulers of the south was uh, female. Aphaliah. The reign of the rulers. The longest reign was 55 years. Uh, it was this, by the southern ruler of Manasseh. He was a wicked king. But he gloriously get, he did get saved. But the influence that he he had and the consequences of his years as a lost man uh, had the influence, uh, had terrible influences in his family and on the nation. The shortest reign was seven days, Zimri, the northern ruler. The average reign in the north was 11 years and in the south was 22 years. We know how hard it is sometimes to put up with eight years of somebody's reign. But uh, think of people reigning even longer, especially if you got a bad one. None of the northern rulers were worshipers of Jehovah. At least eight of the southern rulers were followers of the Lord. Uh, so, uh, sort of see, even uh, though God has his people, uh, you go way back, God said, God said, follow me. God said he'd lead them. They wanted a king. You know, I'll start there. We, we want one of our own making. We want one, you know, just like the others. Uh, so, of course, a lot of things, different things happen through this uh, historic period with the kings. Uh, of course, we saw, see where they're godless. Uh, and uh, Manasseh would have uh, hit it up the, the list of ungodly. Uh, but he was gloriously converted. The most godly southern ruler was Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Okay. The northern kingdom lasted 210 years. The south lasted 345 years. The Assyrians destroyed the north in 721 B.C. The Babylonians destroyed the south in 586 B.C. There was no return to the land by the northern tribes carried off into Assyria. There were three returns to the land by the southern tribes carried off into Babylon. Uh, Zerubbabel led one, Ezra led one, and Nehemiah. So we read about Zerubbabel, but we also have Bible books called what? Ezra and Nehemiah. So that was part of people going back to their land after being uh, uh, carried off from their land. Uh, Jeroboam, he was the first ruler of the northern. Uh, first Kings 12, you can write split. Israel split. Revelation 7, you can write reunite. Reunite. So again, once again, Old Testament has uh, important significance for uh, future events uh, and uh, even our day and time today. Uh, some of the reigns overlapped each other. That is, on occasion, both father and son may have ruled at the same time. Well, so uh, 
you have uh, this and you read all about this in uh, in uh, in first Kings, second Kings, second Chronicles, and uh, so it records all the history here uh, that takes place through through all these kings. Okay, and uh, what's going on? And the kings. You can read about the kings. Uh, speak shares uh, certain details about them. Really how much you want to go in, how much you want to know uh, there about them. And uh, we'll leave pretty much that up to your uh, own personal study there. Uh, in that. and uh, But it's a lot of good read, a lot of interesting uh, uh, facts there about these northern and southern rulers and, uh, and uh, those who deny the power of God those who are ungodly and then of course those who were godly uh, and God used, used them uh, I want to talk uh, from a 9-11 to 70 BC there was Asa he was a godly king, military leader, uh, reigned 41 years. He was a spiritual man. Uh, he uh, cared about the Lord. And he uh, definitely uh, called out to the Lord, cried out to the Lord uh, for his people. Uh, but final years he disobeyed the precepts of God and uh, uh, he did that which was forbidden by God's word uh, he fought against Basha king of northern Israel and made a treaty with Syria seeking their help against uh, his own uh, countrymen even though they had this civil war Uh, he disregarded the prophet of God. He was rebuked uh, by the prophet, but uh, he disregarded that. And in Second Chronicles sixteen ten, the anger king thereupon imprisons the prophet and begins to brutally oppress his own people. Um, he threw Hananiah uh, in prison. The prophet. And uh, they'll often do this, won't they? Uh, they haven't done it. Zedekiah did it to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32.3. Herod Antipas did it to John the Baptizer in Matthew 14 and verse 3. Uh, Asa suffered much from a disease in his foot during the final two years of his life, but refused God's help. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12 through 14. Uh, Jehoshaphat uh, was next, 873 to 848. Uh, and and uh, he ruled for 25 years. And uh, some uh, good things are done there uh, that you can read about. And uh, he was a servant of God. Uh, he rid the land of the male shrine prostitutes. He did not consult Baal, false god. He removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. And uh, so he, he ruled uh, in, a, in a good way. Uh, but he brought... Uh, grief upon himself when he compromised with three ungodly kings. He compromised with Ahab, uh, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. Compromise. We have to be careful. We're told today we got to make deals. we got to compromise. 
you know, well, depends what you're compromising. I mean, there are some things that you meet halfway in the middle on. But there's some things you got to, you just got to stand on the Word of God. On the Word of God, you, just, you can't compromise it. God stand on things. And, uh, you know, it, whatever it means in this life for us that could uh, come about bad, we're to stand with God, not compromise. But, uh, so, again, we just, we see a sin problem uh, permeating throughout. Uh, Uzziah, you'll see some different things about Uzziah, the tenth ruler there, uh, 790 to 740 BC, uh, also called Azariah, and uh, sort of just bring him to your attention. He began to rule when he was 16, 2 Kings 14, uh, 21. So uh, definitely some arrogance. Should you imagine? Of course, uh, there would be older people, you know. Uh, I forget which one of our presidents was the one that had the four terms. Basically, you know, they got sick. His wife pretty much, people don't realize, but his wife really did a lot of things because, you know, sickness, and that's happened in, the, in our history. Uh, so, of course, people would have, you know, even around the young man, there would be, Leaders and things of that nature. A man that was uh, uh, filled with pride and uh, he was confronted and condemned for it uh, by the high priest Azariah along with 80 other courageous priests. Uh, And uh, as he spoke, to them, a leprosy plague from God broke out on his forehead. So, uh, just it's, some, it's an interesting read uh, there. Uh, the Assyrians, as we've said, captured the northern ten tribe kingdom in 722 BC, uh, imprisoning Hashia, the final king there. Thus, for the next 135 years, the southern two tribe uh, kingdom would stand alone. Finally, in 586 BC, it too would fall to the Babylonians. Uh, they have uh, Hezekiah was one of the final eight rulers, and uh, uh, so uh, you'll hear people talk about Hezekiah and uh, his reign. Just have to be careful what we ask for. Uh, Hezekiah became desperately ill and was told by Isaiah uh, that he would die. Second Kings twenty verse one. Uh, the king humbled himself, repented. The king turned his face to the wheel, to the wall, and prayed to God, reminding him of Hezekiah's uh, past faithful service. Uh, and then God then commanded Isaiah to inform Hezekiah his prayer had been answered and he would not die. In fact, the Lord would add an additional 15 years to the king's life. So uh, he prays for more time. He prays that he wouldn't die, that, that uh, um, God would spare him. God does 15 years. But the key is, what are you going to do with that extra time God gives you? How many people have prayed to God and said, God, don't let me die. They have a serious illness or something. Don't let me die. Or don't let, we maybe we pray for somebody else, don't let them die. And God spares their life. And say they live 10 years, say they live 15 years, say they live 20 years. But what do they do with that time? Sometimes, we could say this, maybe it had been better had they died. We don't like to talk about that kind of stuff, do we? Okay. So, uh, uh, 
uh, Hezekiah, of course, uh, uh, became the one who uh, absolutely uh, knew that uh, he would uh, spend so many more days and years. He knew his time, okay? He knew his time. So you think, I know my time. So at first, I guess he's thinking, 15 years, man, 15 years. You know, all right, 15 years, that's a good way away. But it's not really, you know. I'm thinking, my age, that's about what I may have if, you know, something weird don't come. You know, I would think. You know, and then all that, as you get older, you're not going to, I mean, it could be longer, I don't know, but. You know, so uh, how much of it's going to be health, have decent health where you can do certain things or not. That's why it's so important to do what you need to do today for God. He knew he had 15 years, so a lot of times a per person can get comfortable, you know, or if you think, you know, you're, you're okay for a while. Young people perfect example of that. Young people don't think they're going to die in a car accident. That, they're not going to be the one. That's somebody else. They don't think they're going to get some disease and die. They don't, you know, they, they're figuring, that, hey, I'm going to live a while. So, uh, you know, i got some, some things. So it's, uh, it's could be some uh, bad, good things. The hymns of Hezekiah, Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38, verse 9 through 20. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and re was recovered of his sickness. Isaiah 38, 9. See his despair upon hearing that he would die. Isaiah 38, verse 1 through 16. So, uh, in 2 Kings 20, you want to write down Isaiah 38, 9 through 20 in your Bible there, or in your book. Uh, then his dedication upon learning that he would not die. Isaiah 38, 17 through 20. Uh, uh, so uh, it's believed by some scholars that these songs... Uh, it's referred to in Isaiah 38, 20. Uh, refers to uh, 15 psalms. 15 of the psalms during this time. Ten of these psalms were written by Hezekiah himself in memory of the ten steps on the sundial. These were uh, psalms 120, 121, 123, 125, 126, 128, 129, 130, 132, 134. He may then he may then have added five more unpublished songs by of David and Solomon to bring the total to 15. In honor of the 15 years God added to his life. Uh, Psalm believe that Hezekiah spent the last 15 years of his life putting Old Testament scriptures in order. We often find the Hebrew letters H-Z-K at the end of many Old Testament books and the Hebrew manuscripts. Uh, Hezekiah, though, received some uh, ambassadors from the king of Babylon who sent a gift for he had heard of Hezekiah's sickness and recovery. 2 Kings 20, verse 12. Hezekiah foolishly showed these men all the gold, silver, spices, and fine oil he kept in his storehouses. Upon learning of this, Isaiah soundly rebuked the king and predicted the following. Someday the Babylonians will return to carry off all the riches Hezekiah had shown them. Some of the king's own descendants would be taken away to Babylon. Do you know a lot of times that people's I mean, sometimes it's like a random teenage kid in the neighborhood that uh, goes and breaks in houses. Sometimes it's the drug 
guy going and trying to get stuff and sell it and get his uh, drugs. Uh, one of the things they look at first is people you know. People you know. They see what you got. They want it. Perfect example here. He, you know, in a prideful way, he begins to show off things that they have. Uh, so, of course, they get in their heart. Well, we know where to go. And get it. Hezekiah's response to all this was a very selfish uh, response. Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Second uh, Kings 20, 19. In other words, he was totally unconcerned as long as the terrible things did not happen during his reign. As long as it don't happen in my life. How many people are like that? You know, as long as I... As long as this, you know, that we just keep passing things down. Our government keeps passing things down. All right, this is a problem. Let's pass it to the next generation. Let's, you know, pass it to somebody else. And people live like that. That's okay as long, long as I can live out my days. During the 14th year of his reign, the Assyrians marched against Samaria took the city three years later, thus ending the northern kingdom. Seven years after the captivity of the northern ten tribes, the Syrian king Sennacherib attacked Judah, capturing many of its cities. Being aware of Sennacherib's plan to destroy Jerusalem, also Hezekiah constructed a tunnel by which water was brought into the city, 2 Kings 20.20, 20, 20, 2 Chronicles 32. Hezekiah then foolishly asked Sennacherib to forgive his past rebellion and agreed to pay the Assyrian king a huge tribute, stripping all the gold and silver from both the royal palace and temple. 2 Kings 18, verse 14 through 16. In spite of this, the Assyrian army surrounded Jerusalem and uh, Sennacherib sent a personal threatening letter to Hezekiah. At first, Hezekiah bravely attempted to encourage his people. Uh, 2 Chronicles 13. However, then when he saw and heard the terrible threats of the enemy, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and went into the temple to pray. 2 Kings 19. In his prayer, the king both acknowledged and asked. He acknowledged the greatness of God, the past victories. Uh, he asked God to deliver Judah that all the kingdoms might know who is the only true God. He then sent word to Isaiah, urging him to see God also. The answer from the Lord. Hezekiah received from Isaiah a most reassuring message, 2 Kings 19, 34 God had heard the prayer of the king. God's still merciful and gracious. But uh, Hezekiah, who did he seek out? Uh, when things started going, the man of God. And uh, this world, when things start going down, they'll know who the real men and women of God are and who, who they, they'll listen to the false ones right now because they want to hear, you know, what they want to hear. They want to believe what they want to believe. But when things start, I mean, when things, the nitty gritty gets in there, buddy, they, they want to know really what God thinks and really what God's going to do. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, so God deals with that. And uh, it's a good read there, 1 Kings 19. We told you about Manasseh. He's worth mentioning, 695, 642. Uh, very ungodly. He rebuilt the pagan high places. His father, Hezekiah, had destroyed. Uh, uh, built up false worship places, all those things, practice sorcery, witchcraft, mediums, all that, and those kind of things. Uh, did, did a lot of evil. Uh, he ordered, uh, tradition says he ordered uh, Isaiah to be sawn in two. Uh, Hebrews 11.37 seems to make reference to that. He continued to do all these things in spite of repeated warnings from God. Jeremiah the prophet later referred to Manasseh as a symbol of evil. 
Jeremiah 15, verse 4. Uh, but he got converted. This is a great uh, lesson here. God punished Manasseh for all of this by allowing the Assyrians to take him prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bind him with bronze shackles, and take him to Babylon. 2 Chronicles 33, 11. In his distress, Manasseh turned to God and begged for forgiveness. God heard his prayer, saved him, and brought him back to Jerusalem. So, uh, uh, one of the great conversions of all time. The dying thief was a great conversion. Saul, who had become Paul, was a great conversion. I bet you you would think that your conversion was pretty great too. <laughs> so uh, God saves the most wicked, uh, most sinful people. Uh, so you have uh, different ones. Josiah is a good one to look into there. Uh, the Jehoiakim. Uh, as well, 609 to 597. Uh, and then uh, Zedekiah uh, and the king of Babylon. Uh, Zedekiah 597 to 586 BC because that brings us in to, to talk about Nebuchadnezzar uh, as well. So he's there. Uh, Jeremiah is the prophet. Jeremiah is, uh, you know, being used by God. But at the same time, they're not. They don't want to hear what Jeremiah has to say. Uh, so uh, when you read Jeremiah, you want to know a little bit about Zedekiah. Uh, the two prophets, as mentioned before, both Elijah and Elisha, ministered during two kingdom stages. Elijah. Uh, the prophet confronted the wicked king Ahab. Elijah was a prophet from the town of Tishba in Gilead, that land east of the Jordan River, 1 Kings 17.1. He warned Ahab of an impending three and one half year drought from God as punishment for both the sins of the king and those of the of northern Israel. 1 Kings 17, 1. You want to write beside that James 5, 17, and 18. James 5, 17, and 18. After the drought had surpassed three years in duration, God sent Elijah back to Ahab with news that the rains would soon come. And uh, he, then, he then threw down a challenge that he had. 1 Kings 18, 17 through 19. And uh, you get all your, the false prophets and all that. We're going to have a, a little contest, one of the great reads. Uh, thrilling reads of the Bible. Uh, so uh, Isaiah knew how to confront sinners. And, uh, of course, that's not like too much. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Elijah finally graduated. He had a dry, dry, drying brook in, uh, institute uh, in 1 Kings King 17, 2 through 7. After he had first warned Ahab about the coming drought, he was commanded by God to hide himself by the Sheriff Brook at its eastern entrance into the Jordan River. There he was fed by the ravens who brought him bread and meat each morning and evening. After some time, however, the brook dried up. You ever felt like you were in a dry, thirsty land? So possibly a year long, a year or longer, uh, after experiencing this, uh, came the experience of Mount Carmel, uh, challenged in the plan of God 
for his chosen servant. So God took him through God took him through a time of 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 toughness to prepare him for what he was going to use him for. And God will do that. The best institute you can ever go through is Christ's hands-on institute. That's where God deals with you personally. Okay? Uh, Paul spent three years in the Arabian Bible Institute, Galatians 1.18. Moses passed some 40 years uh, in the Sinai Bible Institute. Uh, Elijah went through the Dry Brook Institute. You're going through the Williams. But more importantly, in your life, what you want to go through is the Christ Hands-On Institute. Uh, it's not easy. It's tough. It's those trying times of preparation. You just know that God will prepare you for what He's going to use you for. Okay? 1 Kings 17, Elijah and a widow. That's a... Uh, fascinating story uh, there. Uh, the widow's son died without any warning in her grief. Uh, she cries out. First uh, Kings 17, 18. Note her phrase, O thou man of God. Here was a woman who had seen the prophet out uh, of his pulpit and before he had drunk his first cup of coffee in the morning she saw him as he really was and still could call him a man of God uh, uh, she asked him if he was sent to call her sin to remembrance perhaps some shameful and secret deed in her past had constantly plagued her conscience Elijah restored the dead boy by stretching himself upon the corpse three times and calling out to God. Uh, the grateful widow acknowledged he was indeed a prophet sent from God. So God used him in a mighty way. The woman, it's, a, it's just a great story there and how she trusted and believed. So through all even in difficulties, even in this world that seems to be so filled with evil, evil people, evil leaders, uh, and uh, just, I mean, sometimes you don't know where to turn, but we can always turn to God. So God's always working in individuals' lives, working in people's lives. He always has His people. Okay, He always has His remnant. He always has his true prophets, even in the midst of many false prophets. Uh, he's got Elijah. He's going to have uh, Elisha. He's going to have, uh, eventually we're going to see, he's got, going to have Ezekiel. He's going to have Jeremiah. All these are so crucially important uh, to speak to Israel uh, and to, to their people. Uh, but there's always a people that God has saved. Lord will use. Okay? Now, we shouldn't be astounded that most people are lost. Most people do not trust the Lord. Most people do not follow the Lord. It's always been the case. Okay? And uh, the situation, in fact, uh, the Bible says there's few, there's few that go through the straight and narrow way. There's many that follow the why. Okay? So we see that over and over. People are sinful. Uh, God's willing to save uh, people. Okay? If they'll come to Him. But there's few in, in, in that sense that, that, that come. Okay? And uh, they still continue to make evil choices live their life as if they have uh, forever to live doing their own thing. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, so we definitely, there's a sin problem. This can't get fixed. This can't get fixed. People's trying all kinds of things. We need a king. Maybe this king will do it. Maybe that king, you know, we, we got to get this old time. God's the one that can, the only one that can fix it. Okay? So, uh, oh, that's what we got to learn. We, we're not, we can't fix it. We can't fix ourselves. But God can. Okay? Lord, help us as we continue this read. To, we don't see the successes of man. We don't see the progress of man. Oh, we think we're a lot smarter. We think, Lord, we know so much more and can do so much more. And we're so proud of all our technologies and all those things, Lord. We're just, they just greater instruments for our sins. No, truly, Lord, there's few that really repent of their sin and their wickedness and turn to the righteous one, Lord. But we pray for it. We ask for it. We pray that you would use us in sharing with others, dear God, that they can have salvation. They can be redeemed, dear Lord, by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, God, help us to see ourselves for who we really are. Help us to see the great need that we really have. And help us come to you. Lord, to fulfill those needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.